Uh, thank you indeed for joining us on this important webinar on what do new research results mean for people living with TB and HIV co-infection. Uh, with a very high, a very heavy heart, I dedicate this webinar to fond memories of a very inspiring leader, Dr. Suniti Solomon, who as a scientist and pioneer HIV researcher played a key role in shaping India's response to AIDS. She passed away recently, but her precious legacy in the form of YRD care and all what she did continues to inspire us and will always inspire us. As we all know, TB continues to be a major cause of morbidity and death for people living with HIV. Although this is not news that people with HIV who are co-infected with TB must be put on antiretroviral therapy, what we call ART, ART, irrespective of CD4 cell count. But now today we have a much stronger body of evidence to point towards that. For example, the START study results show that people when diagnosed with HIV should be put on ART irrespective of their CD4 cell count. A CNS correspondent and fellow for this year from Zimbabwe is positively living with HIV. She said to us recently, TB-HIV co-infection is a challenge in Zimbabwe. Although TB and HIV treatment are offered for free in, the con in that country, the problem lies in that the CD4 count tests, viral load tests, liver test functions, etc., they are not People living with HIV are at greater risk from tobacco-related diseases and smoking may also inhibit the effectiveness of life-saving ART drugs. By incorporating a set of practical measures into everyday practice, we can improve the treatment outcomes for men, women and children with TB and HIV. Before I hand over the webinar moderation, to award-winning journalist and commentator Ashok Ram Saroop from South African Broadcasting Corporation in South Africa, let me make a few announcements. Please permit me that. It is my request to the panelists to please make Shoji. their expert comment within 10 minutes. We will sound our friendly beeper cricket sound like this. I think the sound you will hear that sound at the ninth minute, just uh, to let you wrap up. While panelists are presenting, participants can send us their questions using the chat function. There is no need to wait. They can also raise their virtual hand during the question and answer session, which will follow once the presenters have uh, made their present, uh, presentations. But questions on chat can stream in any time during presentations as well. One uh, more announcement I want to do. If there is any person in Hindi who is speaking in this webinar, then I have to say that they are listening to Hindi and we will Hindi session after that when the webinar is finished. If they are listening to the webinar in English, they will not be able to understand it. After that, we will do the Hindi session for them. Agar aise log hamare webinar mein hai aaj. Over to you, Ashok. Good afternoon. Uh, bring you warm greetings from South Africa. Uh, uh, bring you warm greetings from South Africa. I wish uh, we will be getting a, a stimulating talk or perhaps a discussion from our very esteemed um, panel of experts. Um, we're going to hear. Uh, some riveting stuff coming through from Dr. Ann Kumaraswamy, who is one of the U.S. National Institute, Institute of Health, uh, uh, Health uh, Clinical Trial Site Investigator in Chennai for STAR Trial. He's also the Chief Medical Officer at YRG Care. And we also have Dr. Avinash Kanchar, 
medical officer at World Health Organization Global Tuberculosis Program. But before that, I want to bring you something from South Africa, um, where one of our reporters uh, undertaken a, a special report uh, on AIDS itself. The AIDS in the past decade. Over 20 million people know the HIV status. Thanks to government's HIV counseling and testing campaign launched in 2010, 6 million people are living with HIV. At least 2.7 million of them now have access to antiretrovirals. Only 3% of children born to HIV positive moms are born with the virus. Government's target on the prevention of the mother to child transmission program is 1% by 2016. But the challenges remain. Health Minister Arun Gwali. Challenges at this point in time. Maintaining people on prevention, like condoms, like abstaining, like being faithful, has proved to be extremely difficult and a serious challenge. The second challenge is that the antiretroviral program we are running, the biggest in the world, and so it has got its own problems of being new. It has got serious logistical problems, and the hospitals and things get congested, and the health workers have got more work than before. Over and above that, an estimated 400,000 people get newly infected with HIV each year. Majority of them are girls aged 15 to 24. Two million people who need to be on antiretroviral drugs now are not on treatment yet. The supply of treatment for HIV patients is at times interrupted by shortages of drugs at clinics and hospitals. The treatment action campaign believes the glass is half empty since there's no certainty on whether the antiretroviral program will be sustainable over the next decade. The organization is mostly still with laws as they, however, have a reason to celebrate today. We fought long and hard to have antiretrovirals accessible to each and every person. Sorry about that. We now let's listen to Dr. Kumar Swami, who was one of the key scientists of STAR trial on what the results mean for people with HIV and TB. Hello. Hello, Dr. Kumar, are you there? Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, now we can hear you. Yes, Doctor, I can hear you. Oh, right, I'm, I'm trying to share my slides. Uh, 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 you're able to see my screen? Uh, not yet. Yes. Uh, it's showing showing screen, screen sharing. Doctor, what what, what okay. should I do next? You know, I'm able to see my slide here in my screen. Okay, I I cannot see it on my computer, but I think others are able to see it. Perhaps there's something wrong with my laptop. I'm able to see your presentation. There, okay. may be, there may be a slide time gap or something. That is normal. Yeah. So you yeah, can, I'm, able, uh, I'm able to see my sli uh, slides. Fine, fine. fine. I'm able to see slide as well, Doctor. Are you able to see my first slide, which is a title slide with my name? Yes, impact of antiretroviral therapy on disease in resource limited settings. Great. So, so you're able to see the slide, right? Yes, Doctor. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes, Doctor, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you have been living. You know, thank you so much for inviting me to do this presentation. Uh, so what I'm going to speak to you today is on the impact of uh, antiretroviral therapy on uh, a TB disease in resource-limited settings. I'm going to cover uh, two different clinical trials uh, uh, recently being presented and published. And in both the trials, I've been involved as an uh, investigator, and as well as my site has been involved as one of those uh, uh, enrolling sites to contribute to the science of this study. And also, I'm going to walk you through how the outcome of these studies are changing the you know, current treatment guidelines in terms of uh, initiating treatment 
as well as for preventing HIV, TB disease in HIV infected people. Just before you uh, talk about uh, um, uh, the uh, you know uh, the different trials, just for the background, I'd like to tell you that so these are the various opportunistic infections uh, HIV infected persons get that when their immune system gets damaged by the HIV. As you all know that for a normal individual, the CD4 cell count should be more than 350. If it lost less than 350, they are prone to develop various co-infections and, and opportunistic infections. One of the most common things they develop in resource limited setting, especially in India, Thailand, and in Africa, is tuberculosis. So this slide shows one of our study which was been uh, done almost uh, 10 years back and published is one of the largest series been published from a developing uh, country where we have shown that tuberculosis is one of those uh, leading opportunistic infection among patients who are presenting to care. So this is a study of almost 6,800 6, patients who presented to our clinic in Chennai where 35 percent of the patients had presented with tuberculosis in the chest. Studies recently have shown this very clearly. What is this study called HPTN052, which many of you have been aware of this? So, which is a study being funded by US NIH and been carried by a network called HIV Prevention Trial Network under the um, a study name called HPTN052. So, this study is to understand if antiretroviral therapy can prevent HIV transmission to the uninfected partner. So, this study was carried out in eight different countries, in India, Thailand, several countries in Africa, in Latin America, as well as in the U.S. So we recruited 1,750 heterosexual zero discordant couples, that means one person is HIV positive, another has been HIV negative, and who has got a CD4 cell count between 350 to 550. This study was initiated in the year 2003, where the guideline was to initiate treatment when the CD4 count is less than 350 or less than 250. So what we did in this study is we recruited 1,750 serodiscordant couples where one partner is positive and other has been negative. They have been randomized into two different groups. One group received immediate antiretroviral treatment. Another group has been delayed up to 250 CD4 cells or if they develop any other aids defending illness for indication to initiate treatment. I may not have much time to go into the details of the study, but I'd like to tell you what we found in this study is there is 96% reduction in HIV transmission among patients who received immediate antiretroviral treatment as compared to deferred ART. That means they didn't transmit infection you know, to their partners as compared to people who deferred. And also, there are various sub-analysis being done in this particular study, which has been published in the England Journal of Medicine, the initial results in 2011. And the final results were presented last year at the IAS Pathogenesis Conference in Vancouver. What we also found is, other than preventing the HIV transmission, it also significantly prevented various aids defending illness, particularly tuberculosis, uh, in resource-limited settings, especially among patients who received immediate antiretroviral treatment as compared to people who deferred treatment. 
So this study very clearly shows that HIV treatment at a higher CD4 prevents HIV transmission as well as prevent various AIDS to fanning illness including tuberculosis. Then the next question will come is then the cost behind starting treatment at a higher CD4. So our group in collaboration with the uh, uh, Harvard uh, uh, CPEC group which is a group which does a lot of cost effective analysis uh, did an analysis using the uh, data from South Africa as well as from India from this clinical trial and we showed that it is definitely cost saving and cost effective on a long run to prevent the TB and other various morbidity if you start treatment at a higher CD4. Following this, as we all know that in the year 2013, the WHO treatment guidelines moved to initiate treatment at a CD4 of less than 500 for people who have been asymptomatic and for people who have been zero discard and there is one partner positive, another negative to start treatment irrespective of the CD4 is one to prevent transmission and another one is prevent tuberculosis. So if that particular guideline, 2013 guideline, is getting implemented, still not implemented in every region, if it has been implemented widely across in all regions, so what we will get is, as shown in this graph, which is shown by the UNAIDS, the annualized AIDS related death can be prevented, uh, you know, this is a graph where it shows that uh, in 2010, there could be around annual death could be around 1.2 uh, to 1.3 million deaths per year but it can be further pushed to less than 1 million if 2013 guidelines is uh, implemented across the region and also by 2025 you know you can see there are uh, uh, almost 3 million deaths can be averted by implementing this 2013 guidelines across the globe so there is a lot of work needed first to be implemented 2013 guidelines Having said this, now the STAR trial has been uh, published. So the, this is a trial where HIV infected people who are totally asymptomatic with a CD4 cell count of more than 500 has been recruited for this clinical trial to answer the question, if you start treatment at a higher CD4 of more than 500, what could be the benefit for these individuals? In this particular trial recruited almost 4,600 individuals. The study happened in 100 different countries including India including in our center YRG care which is one of the second highest enrolling site for this clinical trial. So again this particular trial has got two different groups. One group received antiretroviral treatment when the CD4 is more than 500 and another one group wait up to less than 350 CD4 because that was an indication to start treatment by the WHO guidelines when the trial was started. So this trial happened for more than three years and uh, in the month of May, initial analysis was done. And what is found in this particular trial is where you can see this uh, graph where the red color graph is among patients who received immediate treatment and the blue color uh, uh, right graph is patients who defer treatment up to 350. And if you can see in this particular table, what you can see this is patients who defer treatment, they had more AIDS defining illness as well as non-AIDS complication as compared to the people who received immediate treatment. That is uh, 14 versus 50 in terms of serious AIDS defending complications. And in non-AIDS complications like diabetes and cardiovascular and kidney disease, it is 29 versus 47. It very clearly shows that when you start treatment at a higher CD for a more than uh, 500, it not only prevents AIDS defining complications, but also a lot of non-AIDS complications. For today's discussion here, I again go into the little more details of this start study which if you look into this, what are those AIDS defining illness in developing country and just for your information, this start trial has been uh, happened both in resource limited setting as well as in resource rich settings like in Europe, in Australia, as well as in the US. In developing countries, among patients uh, who received immediate treatment, they're able to prevent the tuberculosis. That is six versus 20 where they defer treatment. In resource rich settings where they uh, conducted this trial, what happened is that they are able to prevent various malignancies like lymphoma and Kaposi sarcoma, where you can see lymphoma 3 versus 10 and Kaposi sarcoma 1 versus 11. So if we put all these uh, you know, uh, data together, so this very clearly shows that starting treatment at a higher CD for more than 50 prevented various genetic infection, mainly TB, and as well as other non aids complications like malignancies and cardiovascular disease and kidney disease. It very clearly shows that treatment should be given to every HIV infected 
market people irrespective of the CD4. Now these results were discussed very heavily at the WHO guidelines panel recently and there was a presentation done at the Vancouver meeting by the WHO um, uh, team and they said they will be launching this guideline next month in September and uh, hopefully we can see in recommendation that all HIV infected people irrespective of the CD4 will be initiated on treatment. This is mainly prevent tuberculosis in developing countries like India and in South Africa. Just before I end my talk, I'd like to tell you that what is happening in resource limited setting is the mean CD4 to initiate treatment is still very low. So the data being published till 2014 where you can see the CD4 representation to our clinics is in lower income, lower middle income, upper middle income countries still is very low, less than 200. That means we are not testing enough to find people at a higher CD4 so that they can be linked to care, they can be put on treatment so that we can prevent various HIV related morbidity, mainly tuberculosis in those in people who have been infected with HIV. So this is a data again being published uh, by UNAIDS uh, in their document recently where you can see the, the center um, uh, um, a chart where is a green colored one where you can see if I had a figure from India where uh, all of those 2.1 million people now only around 40 percent of them are put on antiretroviral treatment. So what happened to the remaining uh, 55 to 60 percent of them? You know, the, uh, we have not found them so we are not able to test them and if they are not being linked to care. So that means it very clearly shows that even when we have all this clinical trial data being available to start treatment at a higher CD4, but we don't have the individuals in our clinic to uh, put them on treatments. For this very importantly needed is in our developing countries, we need more and more testing. How to do this testing? It varies from country to country. How often it should be done? And uh, what will be the cost behind this? We need a lot of exercise on this. I like to end my talk by showing a data from India, which we did an exercise on the clinical impact and cost effectiveness of expanded HIV testing to identify people with high CD4. We use the uh, figures from our national program on prevalence and incidence and the cost for HIV testing and counseling and linking them to the care. I may not have time to go into the details of the study, but we can discuss during the discussion. So how we can achieve this is if we can do a voluntary HIV screening among our national population every five years, which will offer substantial clinical benefit and cost effective and if we do annual HIV screening uh, which will be cost effective if you do it at the high risk population that is a key population that they inject in drug users, MSM, female sex workers and migrant population also in high prevalent districts based on the figures from our national program. For South Africa again we need separate exercise to do how often this HIV testing should be done and to link to care so that we can find people at high CD4 so that they can be put on treatment based on the recent results thereby we can prevent TB and other related comorbidities. So today thanks to these antiretroviral therapeutics we've got different lines of treatment. The first is we have first line of treatment and we have second line of treatment and as well as in certain countries we also have third line of treatment. So with all these various antiretroviral treatment today HIV disease is yet another chronic manageable disease. People can live for many number of years with these medications if these patients have access to treatment and if we can find them, we can put them at the appropriate time where we can make these individuals live longer, healthily and productively and thereby we can prevent various HIV related morbidity. And thank you very much. With this, I'll uh, end my presentation and happy to take questions at our discussion time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. There you have it. Uh, that was Dr. Kumaraswamy, who is one of the U.S. National Institute of Health and Clinical Tri Trial Site Investigator in Chennai for START Trial. He's also the Chief Medical Officer at YRG.
the more details and the explanations around those recommendations. My first recommendation around the intense fatigue in case finding the WHO recommends use of clinical algorithms uh, to screen all people living with HIV at every contact uh, the health system using the clinical algorithm which which uh, which could be simple to do that uh, all the problems that we for adults it could include those people uh, uh, the fever, the child and spirits and um, which can be printed by the health staff. Easy. And for children, you know, the same, but there's a clinical algorithm um, which can be used to, to screen systematically. And once uh, uh, the set for then we move on to once uh, 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 the, the purpose of the HIV is screened um, and the uh, symptoms and disease um, so come to happen. Uh, is unlikely to have PTD. You know, it should be after a PTD, which, which can be uh, six months. Uh, uh, Some recommendation uh, after six months, uh, depending on the particular situation. Uh, similarly, in children, uh, 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 IPT is recommended. Uh, uh, both uh, uh, the pregnancy period and when you have the pregnancy of age and the specific symptoms. Uh, uh, the third one is about uh, infection control, and, uh, and there's, a, there's a separate document which talks in detail about the infection control and the specific control of things. And uh, the important uh, important measures of the administrative levels, and the environment measures that are necessary to reduce the infection uh, in the facilities and personal protective measures. Move uh, on to the third, third component uh, of uh, the recommendation, and it's about producing the of HIV, and which starts with uh, the HIV testing counseling amongst all physical and diagnostic cases, and then providing personal support and PRP. So, the first uh, recommendation in this is uh, uh, testing should be written to the physical and diagnostic cases. So it can be scaled, it can be scaled up only if it can be mainstreamed within the HIV testing. So the future comes to the programs to mainstream for example, HIV testing in the future patients. Provision of HIV prevention is also an opportunity for the TB settings, and that's one of the recommendations. And but the most important thing and which will be relevant to the discussions today is um, the recommendation related to treatment. Uh, CPT is recommended uh, with the CPT is uh, ART is a uh, of the CPT and uh, uh, so there are three uh, carriers which explain the CPT uh, and the CPT and the CPT followed by ART in uh, the interviews. Uh, and CD4 comes to the point of view, it should be started within two weeks. Okay, that is it, and I'm um, happy to take questions related to the guidelines. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was Dr. Avinash Kanchar, Medical Officer at World Health Organization, Global Tuberculosis Program. Hello? Shobha, Hello. I lost you. Yes. Shobha, I lost you, Shobha. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Lovely, lovely. We, uh, can, can we just pose some questions to our yes. panelists? Uh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm again requesting the participants to please uh, type in your questions. Uh, or uh, raise the virtual hand and ask questions as you please. Meanwhile, we have a question for Kumar from uh, Oven Nayaka, a correspondent from Malawi. Uh, I think, Kumar, you may have to readdress this, may but you have spoken about this in your presentation. Uh, he says, after successful STAR study results, what should be the next step so that people in sub-Saharan African countries can access 
early treatment regarding HIV and TB co-infection. Kumar, the question is for you. Hello? I think you, you, have, you have muted me. What did I Hello? Do Hello? You want to hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you, Kumar. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, you know, if I understood the question correctly, uh, what are the implications of the start study results for Africa? Is that a question? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, what needs to be done more? What should be the next step so that yeah. people then can access early treatment? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this question. So, so that's the whole objective of this study. You know, now the study very clearly shows that if we start treatment at a high CD4 count, more than 500, which currently is not recommended uh, by the WHO guideline, um, so we study any benefit. The study very clearly shows it prevented tuberculosis in developing countries, like in India, in Africa, and other developing countries. Also prevented other AIDS-defining complications. In research-rich settings, it also prevented malignancies. Also, so today, HIV-infected patients also been developed other than these opportunistic infections also develop cardiovascular, kidney disease, and liver disease because of premature aging. So this study also showed that there was a dramatic reduction in the, uh, a reduction in the occurrence of non-AIDS complications. So following this, now the guideline panels of various guidelines, like DHSS, that's a guideline which is followed up in the US, IAS USA guideline, British HIV guidelines, and European guidelines have already been recommended to start treatment irrespective of the CD4. So WHO 2015 guidelines panel have already met and have discussed this and they have not officially launched the guidelines yet, which I was told it will be done in next month, but the WHO uh, guidelines team uh, made a presentation at the IAS pathogenesis conference last month in Vancouver stating that so there will be a recommendation for starting treatment for everyone who has been HIV positive. So here the implication is, so everyone will receive antiretroviral treatment irrespective of the CD4. So that means the benefit will be reduction in TB and a lot of other uh, co-infections and other comorbidities and including uh, how to access this treatment. The minute when it become a WHO document, policy document, the country programs will adapt in a stepwise way so that uh, people with HIV people with HIV, irrespective of the CD4, will have access to treatment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Kumar. Another question for you from a correspondent from India. Uh, the correspondent asked that uh, regarding your suggestion for annual HIV screening, how practical would it be when we are missing millions of cases of TB and a lot of people living with HIV who are not yet aware of their status? How can we scale up this testing? Yeah, that's absolutely the million dollar question, not only for India, even for the United States, you know, for the whole world. Uh, the numbers, what we have been uh, hearing and seeing from UNAIDS and WHO and the country program is all estimates. They're all not headcount numbers, they're all estimates. Still, there are millions and millions of people need to be tested for HIV. You know, it's going to be a task, not one day task, it's going to take years and years and decades. For India, we have developed this model based on the current available prevalence and incidence. If you do every five years uh, HIV testing in the national population or annual HIV testing in the key population, that is among injecting drug users, MSM, and female sex workers who have got high risk to acquire you know, HIV because of their risk factors. So how to do this? I think everyone has to play a role. You know, the NGOs who have been involved in various welfare program for these uh, key population, also the government, also the various programs, and we are also talking to various other clinicians in different speciality, how you can offer HIV testing for anyone who comes to your hospital so that uh, if they have a risk, they take a HIV testing, or you can also even explain to them what are the benefits of this HIV testing, the way they can be linked to care. It's going to be difficult. We don't have any short or quick answer that do this way. You know, we need to try some model, and we'll come across a lot of issues, including stigma, cost, and how to scale this. I think we have to go 
take it up from you know uh, step by based on this implementation. Maybe I can also ask uh, if anyone from Africa you want to add anything. You know how you know this can be done in Africa. I know it's a different situation there where HIV epidemic is much higher than in India, where they have been recommending annual HIV screening. There, there is uh, uh, N. Chanda from Zambia who again uh, wants to know from you, Kumar. Uh, he thanks you for the, your presentation and says in early years of ART, there were concerns of exposing patients to drugs in early stages, vis a vis cumulative effects of drug side effects. Is, mm -hmm. is this still a concern? What has changed, if any? Because now we are talking of early initiation into ART. It's a very important question. You know, you know, the, till few years back, we didn't have good antiretroviral drugs. You know, we had drugs which develop a lot of side effects like stavudine and sidovudine. Now, with the better drugs, side effects are less, and uh, benefits are far more. And again, having said this, the re recent clinical trials also had shown if you start treatment at a higher CD4, the side effects are much lesser because their immune system is intact. They are not taking other medications for uh, opportunistic infection like TBs, thereby less interactions, drugs, antiretroviral drugs with other drugs. And also patients when their immune system is very intact and very healthy and they don't have even the minor issues related to these, uh, you know, uh, antiretroviral drugs and thereby they're able to take this drug, you know, well. So for various reasons, these trials have shown which has not been uh, implemented uh, across the regions but there are countries are implementing but there are enough benefits the trials have shown programs have shown by providing IPT it prevents uh, tuberculosis and prevent morbidity and mortality so uh, in Uganda and other African countries IPT should be available because isoniazid acid is a very cheap drug only thing the policy has not been introduced because of some challenges like finding you know TB uh, a diagnosis bef ruling out before you put them some non isoniazid prophylaxis you know this type of issues really hampered the implementation but now the programs are working hard in close with WHO to implement this but there are a lot of benefits with IPT uh, then we have a uh, journalist from Myanmar Luen Luen Thant who wants to know is early ART initiation cost saving for HIV patients. What about adherence? Is adherence an issue for people when they are still healthy? Right. Um, I can definitely answer this question. I think, and I think these are all other nuances when you, when you have been trying to implement, um, you know, certain uh, uh, interventions. So when you say, when you talk about antiretroviral treatment, it's not just uh, loading someone's mouth with these um, uh, medications. So we have to offer a package of care. You know, we have to do the appropriate counseling about the drugs, they make options for their um, uh, readiness to initiate treatment, and of course, uh, they should be alerted about the importance of adherence. If they're not adhering to the drugs, these drugs are not going to be useful. It's going to be more harmful. So adherence is very, very important. And again, studies have shown when someone's uh, CD4 is very good and well intact, they adhere better as compared to people who are really sick who may tend to miss pills for various reasons. So I think uh, being uh, well and with a higher CD4 will not be an excuse uh, for poor adherence. I think it's very important by the clinicians, providers, and counselors and the programs to give a lot of importance in, to import and counsel you know, adherence on HIV infected people even before initiating treatment. 
Thank you. Uh, Kumar, although you did answer the question, but I think we have Avinash online, so I can pose the, ask the question of him again. Uh, Avinash, uh, Alison wants to know, is IPT readily available in most countries? Because colleagues working in Uganda say that these were not available and that IPT was not being provided. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I was on mute. So I was not able to respond. But, uh, but uh, if we look at the global data that we got reported for this year, uh, 2014, we see increasing number of countries uh, reporting on IPT, and uh, uh, at least 25 of uh, the 41 high uh, priority data countries did report on IPT this year. And we have more than a million, up to a million patients on IPT now. It's, it's getting scaled up, and that means probably uh, IPT is uh, available in most of the country. But uh, the bigger bottleneck remains at the policy level, that uh, it's not implemented, uh, taken up as a policy, and then uh, there could be operational issues like uh, lack of uh, IPT in some countries, uh, like the uh, common uh, But But, but uh, it's available. Uh, as far as we understand from the infection uh, to the country, and that's definitely not an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists, to our participants, and to our moderator. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there is another question uh, which is coming up. Uh, I'll just ask you that question. It's there. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, in, if both of you can answer, perhaps, in times when uh, AIDS budget strings are really tightening, will it be a challenge convincing governments to put people on ART early enough? Huh. That, that, that's a question not only for HIV, for every disease. For these mm -hmm. reasons, um, uh, to satisfy so the policy makers, so we also do other cost effectiveness analysis. Um, one such uh, study also I put up in my presentation is on, on the HPT and O52, where we uh, 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 recommended to initiate treatment, the CD4 of 500, to prevent transmission, uh, TB, and other morbidities. So uh, we did the cost effective analysis uh, for India as well as for South Africa, which shows very clearly if we can uh, uh, put treatment at a higher CD4, because the cost involved in preventing, averting a new transmission infection, as well as to prevent a morbidity like TB or on hospitalization, which is going to be very expensive by, as compared to the people who are put on treatment. I think this type of cost effectiveness studies really, uh, you know, helps these policymakers and program managers how they can reprogram and re-budget their resources to uh, particular diseases to uh, get these uh, outcome and as a result we can save cost on a long run. So uh, you know, again having said this, the current cost effectiveness studies very clearly shows that if you put treatment at a higher CD4 where the cost will be high <coughs> upfront, but on the long run you know, it will average out in such a way that it will be cost effective in terms of preventing the transmission as well as preventing hospitalization and morbidity and the cost for uh, drugs for other opportunistic infections. Okay, we have a, a correspondent from, uh, from Sudan, Khalid Omar, uh, who wants to ask a question. I think he has raised his hand, so we will wait for him to ask. Yes, Khalid. Hello. 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 Yes, yes. Please speak a little louder, Khalid. Please ask your question. Hello? 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 <coughs> Hi, yes, good, good evening. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Just uh, my question about the flexibility of, about the trips of medication for HIV people. And that uh, one of the ways to break a patient monopoly and uh, achieve lower drugs cost for bad HIV or
and many generic companies have access to manufacture also some of the newest protease inhibitors now we are also waiting for some of the new drugs new integrase inhibitors like doltegravir and as well as daranavir you know you know through these uh, mechanism so there are a lot of ways underway so there will reduce the cost by the medications uh, by the indian by the generic companies uh, both in india as well as in south africa as well as in other countries by working closely with the innovative companies thank you kumar uh, before we wrap up finally i just uh, want to ask if there are any hind uh, participants koi shrota jo hindi mein isko sunna chahte hain to please wahan chat function pe abhi turant ye type kar dein ki aapko hindi mein webinar hindi mein sunna hai to hum log iska translation aapko denge iske baad agar agar aisa hai to aap abhi type kar dein please and uh, i thank once again uh, our panelists participants and ashok for a really very very meaningful webinar today and uh, we will be sending uh, sending the uh, ref all the reference material and the webinar recording to all our participants to help the journalists develop news articles in the ne within the next few hours we will be sending the webinar recording thank you very much and have a good day thank you thank you so much thank you to our panelists as well